I'd like to acknowledge Australia's First Nation people as the traditional custodians of the land, and for this episode in particular, the Ghana people. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We are always looking to create you know, the very best product we can, but more than that, to give a beautiful, uh, meaningful experience to the, you know, literally thousands of people that come here every year um, and might have been coming here for, for decades. This is Over a Glass. I'm Shante Whale. Peter Lloyd is the CEO of Coriol in the Vale, a multi-generational winery that is steeped in history but is also on the front foot of a changing landscape in Australian wine. Peter joins me today. Hi, Peter. Thank you very much for having me. Peter, you didn't just walk into Korea one day and just take over. It's a part of who you are. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, sort of almost the opposite <laughs> in some ways. Um, I mean, I grew up here and um, was very lucky to, to do that. Um, but that was, you know, a very different time. It was the 80s and it was, you know, nothing like it is now. <laughs> and um, So it was just like growing up on a sort of a small farm, I guess, and um, and where at that stage my dad who had come back into the business um, and, um, and my mum and it was very um, – and my grandparents were here on the weekends and it was, you know, my dad did everything and uh, whether it was bottling wine or baking wine or serving customers or, you know, it was, it was small and, um, and it was just a lovely sort of natural environment to, to grow up in but also very interesting because you got to be involved in every little – every little part and um and so um that you know that was the only sort of world i knew and um and uh yeah so look it was you know i don't want to um uh dismiss it It was certainly a very great amazing place to, to grow up but um it was um it was uh it was all I knew, and um, and then when I left, uh, you know, when I was finished finished school and, and left, and um, I didn't at that point really. I don't, I'm not sure if I thought that I would come back, <laughs> and um, and I wasn't that interested in. Um, I mean, I had an interest for wine, but it wasn't like you know it dominated my all of my thoughts and and waking hours. I was interested in other things, and so um, yeah, so it was that kind of idea of, and certainly the the the. The narrative was well. If you ever do want to be involved in this business, you know, you have to go and make yourself the absolute right person for the job with your skills and experience and perspective, rather than assume a, a position because you're family. And um, and so that was probably the strongest message that was <laughs> was drilled into us. And so yeah, there certainly was no kind of expectation or um, or uh, or sort of pre pre preset path, if you like, and um, so yeah, you know, it was sort of went off and, and, and did lots of other things, and um, and uh, and eventually found my sort of my way back. But um, yeah, it was probably only sort of ten years ago that it was like, oh, actually, yeah, maybe this is something that I um, feel like I'm developing enough skills and insight and perspective and interest in its own right, wine as a, you know, wine as um, a standalone rather than the connection through to the family business. So maybe slightly different to how some um, family businesses operate. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, um, I can't imagine that far ahead, but <laughs> I guess I would certainly be encouraging the same for the next generation if they were ever to be involved that, you know, you've got to go out and do other things and, and you know, bring exciting things back, you know. Um so, yeah, certainly not, certainly not predetermined, but um, but yeah, feel very privileged now to to sort of be back here and um, and enjoy all the the greatness that that it provides. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, <laughs> and all the you know <laughs> head scratching and hard work and you know, it's um, yeah, wineries and vineyards are pretty dynamic sort of businesses and um, not without their challenges, but um, but certainly. Uh, yeah, feel privileged that uh, of our sort of diversity and breadth of, of varieties and and um, uh, things that I might have perceived as inefficiencies in the past um, over the last few years have uh, have been great. Um, you know, just have that broad spread. So yeah, no, it's great. There's that movie that's come out recently called Everything All at Once, and I just think I don't know where that saying's come from before, but I just keep using it all the time because it just seems to make sense of so many things. And I think 
just what you said there, like, you know, a wine business is everything and it's all at once and it's great and it's confusing and it's hard and uh, there's lots of spoils and, uh, yeah, I suppose you, you get to see all the light and dark, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I was lying awake at 5.30 this morning and, you know, my – which I normally don't. Normally I sleep like a baby, but for some for some reason I, you know, and I was thinking about the things that were going through my head and it was like wastewater management and how are we going to fix that pump? And then it was, oh, is that export order? Did I put the right mandatories on the USA labels? And, oh, that, you know, the, the you know, the, the, the bizzo in the kitchen that we've got to work out with the with the chef and, and the, you know, the distributor wants this, but we don't actually have any of that. And, um, oh, someone wants a... Um, uh, what's the word, uh, you know, a guided tour of the estate with, you know, because they want to spread their dad's ashes. And so, you know, and you think, oh, <laughs> so many different kind of, <laughs> or have we made the right decision pruning the vineyard that way or whatever it is. So, yeah, it's um, that variety is at, you know, at its worst is just an absolute cluster, but at its best is what makes the, <laughs> the job interesting because, um, yeah, if you are, um uh, I mean, I don't. I, maybe the term is vertically integrated, uh, um, which seems a bit silly to sort of use that term. But um, you know, where you are producing what you are then making and then bottling and then selling, um, maybe direct to the customer over a lunch in the restaurant or in a cellar door or through to a distributor or through to an export customer in the states or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, there's lots of different parts, and it's a pretty dynamic. Um, uh, industry from that point of view. So, um, sure yeah. There is. I'm, I'm <laughs> glad that I'm not your brain at 5.30 in the morning, you know, like that is, that's intense. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, I mean, like I said, it's not normally like that, but something about the moon or something this morning, I was like, oh, you know, <laughs> as your mind does. Anyway, it's. Um, yeah. And always at that, the worst possible time, most of the time at 3 a.m. or whatever, whatever time it should just be resting. I want to go back a little bit further before we get to kind of what your role is now and talk a little bit about your father. Was there a time, I mean, obviously when when you, I want to kind of get into your brain of what you kind of thought when you were a kid um, and growing up and seeing your dad, like you said, do a bit of everything and then kind of fast forward to kind of your relationship now and, you know, was there a time when you just thought he was a really busy man and you didn't really, you know, wondered why he was doing so much and did that just completely transcend, you know, at a certain time in your life? <laughs> well, it's a it's it's a good question because if anyone, like a lot of Coriol's, well, most of Coriol's success is is down to to him and his mind and his insatiable appetite for what's new and what's interesting, and not a lot of commercial um, grounding often, but then. Often, if you're doing something interesting and innovative, and you care about what you're doing, well, then the you know the commercial stuff can follow. Um, that's the hope. <laughs> and um, but he um, several years ago was um, uh, it was I'm not sure how official it was or whether it was just the guy that he in his swimming class that uh, diagnosed him as with 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 ADHD, and it explains so much about the way that he's operated his life over the last however many years and that insatiable demand of starting a project it's so infectious his enthusiasm for it whether that might be olives or oil or a new variety or charcuterie or cabbage or figs or tango dancing or whatever it is and it's so full-on and so consuming for a period of time and then it stops often and everyone else is still sort of you know, still kind of swimming, trying to catch up, but he's on to the next thing. And what's left is the, you know, <laughs> the remnants of, of whatever project that was. And, um, but that's fine, you know, because some of those things come to fruition and, and some of them don't. But then, of course, because he is, can be quite impulsive, um, then there's this feeling of often quite severe regret. Um, and, um, and so he, you know, I, I do feel for him because he, 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 um, He's created, you know, great, amazing things, but it hasn't been without, you know, a toll to him um, you know, mentally because um, it's just it's a bit of a chaotic space, I think, his brain. And um, I think the best thing for him was uh, maybe 12 years ago leaving 
Kyra, well, not uh, he still he was still working here, but he he stopped living here and moved ten kilometres away. And overnight, he was a calmer, more refreshed human being. And um, and so he's um, yeah, you know, like I said earlier, it can be all all consuming. And and so I certainly made the um, the decision not to not to live on site because um, yeah, you just get you can convince yourself that you know you're crucial to every single every single thing that happens here but really over the last few years it's it's really sort of showing that you build a really strong team and you trust other people and um and you can get some of your headspace back but um yeah that's also you know a business has to be of a certain scale and size to be able to warrant that as well so um yeah i think that the huge amount of kind of energy and expansive thought and enthusiasm and um that he's brought to this business has been, I mean, look, yeah, the last three years has been, um, uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes I looked at what we did and the huge range of products and the huge amount of markets and, the, you know, smelling, selling a small amount to a lot of different people has been wildly inefficient, but you probably couldn't have had a better strategy over the last sort of three or four years with all the ups and downs. And, um, and so it's... Um, yeah, it's it's you know we're probably um, well we're very grateful <laughs> I guess for that but um, so yeah he's uh, but he's still not calming down I mean he's like he he uh, he's in Tasmania at the moment he bought a vineyard or a property there um, in that feral summer of 2019 when he um, when half the country was on fire and um, and uh, so he can be quite impulsive and um, so I was you know looking through the data and saying where has had the lowest overnight temperatures in Australia you know you know maniacally going through all of this weather data and um oh tamar valley tamar valley it's the only place that's cooling down to this temperature overnight therefore you know that's got the better long chance run of, of being sustainable viticulture for you know 20 30 years to come so um so that's what he does he goes and you know starts in um in uh, in, in in the tamar valley and um, so you know he's uh and but then at the same time he's he's got projects going with you know uh, with pruning, uh, different pruning techniques or different vineyard management techniques or whatever it is. So um, he's retired, but he's busier than he's ever been. What a fascinating individual and what an amazing man to have as a father. <laughs> uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, your love of food. Um, that took you on a, a little bit of a kind of garden path, um, but did bring you back around to wine at the end of the day. Tell me a little bit about where food took you? Yeah, I mean, I got my first job in a restaurant when I was twelve, and um, and that was what I was interested in, and um, and that restaurant was really important. Um, well, still is um, in in the sort of McLaren Vale community, and um, it really brought a lot of people together, and it was a um, what's the word? A very um, a very uh, culturally important restaurant. Anyway, so sort of worked there for maybe ten years, and um, whilst I was at school, and um, and then got um, and then got. Uh, sorry, just had to uh, remove some people from the building, um, uh, <laughs> and then um, and then just thought, you know, this is really interesting and exciting. So I ended up in in, in France looking for, I guess, food related opportunities and. Um, and so I, d- I had done a vintage in Beaujolais, and that's when Beaujolais was, um, uh, what's the word, on on its uh, on its knees, if you like. It was uh, that was a, some time ago, but it was you know it was pretty horrific if you think about it now. You know, prior to vintage, there'd be multiple you know growers that would you know basically give up, and um, and uh, prior to, to vintage, nine they just weren't going to make it through. Such was the depressed state of the. <laughs> Of the uh, the local industry, obviously incredibly different now. Anyway, the point was that that I'd, I'd done this vintage, and and um, there was a bakery and in this town, and um, everything was made by hand. There was no; it was all wood fired oven, and it was um, it was just this beautiful, beautiful spot. And um, I guess I just asked for a job, and and a local family said that they'd put me up, and. Um, I can't quite remember how it all happened, but it was excellent. You know, it was this just amazing experience of um, of creating really, really high quality artisan bread, which was um, not like it's very different now. But like twenty five years ago, that was not 
available in South Australia. You know, you couldn't just, you, you know, you couldn't find high quality bread. And, um, and so that sort of led to, I guess, a bit of a extended, um, uh, what's the word, period of time overseas. And I ended up studying in, um, uh, in the San Francisco Baking Institute, which was sort of the place for artisan bread making. And um, yeah, I was at a bit of a crossroads after that and um, ended up somehow in in Paris and um, and sort of a couple of things went right <laughs> for me at that time and I got managed to find this job in a bakery in Paris and um, and uh, yeah it was just awesome it sort of extended the the love and the passion of um, of bread making and um, and I'd had a um, a guy I knew he'd heard I was in Paris and he said, mate, you can, you know, my apartment's there doing nothing, live there. And so I had this great apartment and um, it was one of those moments in your life where you kind of, um, I don't know, maybe you're a, you open yourself up to the possibility or you're a bit vulnerable or you allow people to help you. And um, yeah, it was really good. <laughs> I ended up having this great time and, um, and in a bakery, which at that point was not that well, it's sort of becoming less and less common to have that sort of Parisian bakery where on street level it's beautiful and downstairs actually is where everything is made in the basement and so that's where I was working. And, um, and uh, yeah, the guy, I'd been there, I don't know how long, maybe six months or something, and then the guy <laughs> offered me a job and I gave me a contract and I think it was like 800 euros a month or <laughs> something like it was horrific and um and I sort of had this moment of looking around me at all the people that I worked with who I liked but were all pretty socially ill-adjusted and worked you know only in the dark you know they, they they never saw the daylight and um and so yeah then I um must have gone off and started studying and so I went to London did WSET and um and sort of uh yeah, after a few fits and starts doing other things, eventually came back and, and started in the wine industry. But that was, um, yeah, it was really important to go and, um, you know, go and see other things and, and you know, and develop those sort of skill sets in, in, in the industry outside of wine. Mm. It does seem to be a recipe for the, for the longest established and, and most successful wine businesses. It, it tends to be that the, the wisdom of uh, prior generations know that they have to go and spread their wings, try other things, and then decide that they really want to be in the wine business. Because I, as you said, it's a hard business to be in. And unless you really love it and you're really dedicated to it, you're not going to last. So I, I see this time and time again, but I also think it's risky of, of those families to say, you know, go and try being a lawyer or try to be an art artisan or whatever it may be, because you could lose your kids along the way to another another craft, and uh, so it does come with some risk. Yeah, but that's I don't know. I think I think it certainly outweighs it because if your kid wants to be a lawyer, let him be a lawyer. You know, if your kid wants to be an artist or a, or a struggling baker, then you know you've got to let them do that. I mean, it's um and because it's you know it's it, it's sort of about it's. Yeah, I know what you're saying, but it's. Um, I certainly um, think that we can overdo the importance of our own business, um, and um, you know, I'm presuming that Coriol will go on into the future. But you know, if it doesn't, and there's no family that want to own it, well, whatever. You know, <laughs> it's. Um, you know, you can't get too precious about these things either. I mean, I remember going to this place in. Um, it was a producer in the Mosul, and um, and we were having a chit chat about various things, and and I asked how old his business was, and and uh, he's like, oh, I'm about eight hundred years. <laughs> and he was the thirty eighth generation or something, and uh, you know, so that's what can happen, but um, yeah, <laughs> you know, you also don't want the kind of the, the 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 family business and the legacy and all that sort of stuff to override the, the the potential to for new opportunities and, and new things otherwise it just gets a bit stale and boring i think but um so yeah i've got sort of yeah mixed views on it but um but yeah certainly uh i'm very grateful that um well I, I, it, it, it wasn't even that it was um it was uh there certainly was no opportunity to um to, to, to have a job here unless <laughs> in, in, in unless i'd gone and and done other things. So, um, 
Yeah. I think that that's the Australian mindset a little bit too and also, you know, the love of your kids to to put what they want um, at the forefront and their happiness over, yeah, the the family business and the importance of of keeping it within the family. So it says a lot about you as well. But I want to know, after you uh, did your best set in London, after that you did return to Australia, you kind of moved into the distribution side of things. What did that teach you about the Australian wine industry? Mm, Probably the reality of it, (laughs) you know, (laughs) that I think so many people, so many wine or people with wineries or wine brands just have this completely um, skewed view of of how important they think their own product is and and how much they should be able to charge for it. And, um, you know, it's uh, unfortunate. Like, uh, um, I'm sounding a bit cynical here. I'm not trying to, but I guess th- the point is that if you want to – to be have your product widely distributed and have a broad distribution footprint, you know, you've got to make it work for your distributor, you've got to make it work for your retail partners, for your restaurant partners. Like if, if people aren't making their margin, then forget about it. <laughs> you know, you just yeah, you're a non starter. And that can be a hard reality for um, a lot of especially smaller wine producers that might start going direct and have built their whole business model based on that and their pricing structure. And then um, they start having conversations with distributors and, and they're like, hold on, what, you want me to you want me to give you half? Like, are you crazy? You know, and that's a hard thing for people to, to get their head around. But And look, yeah, we all know the margins are incredibly slim, but um, you, uh, if you want that, You've, <laughs> you've got to understand it. So, um, and uh, yeah, so really important, just understanding how the market, you know, how the wholesale market works is, um, yeah, it's very important, I think, to, to uh, setting yourself up for, for long-term, yeah, long-term success in that channel. Um, and you are, and you, then you really, <laughs> you understand how, um, what's the word? Um, you know how fashion plays such a huge part in in the industry, and um, and you understand that um, yeah, there's not a lot of room for sitting still <laughs> um, in 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 this industry. Like you either have to be innovating with you know new products or new varieties or new techniques, or or um, you know there's very few producers that have the luxury of just saying this is how we've done it, this is how we're always going to do it, um, and still sell all their wine each year and um so yeah look for a business like ours we're very lucky that we have such a strong history and we have such a strong direct to consumer uh market but you know we still need our products to be widely distributed uh, throughout uh, australia and um so yeah having a really solid understanding of that business is crucial i think um so yeah that was um and and to do it at a scale i worked with a larger sort of corporate owned um they were caught run um, firm, and that was great because you also sort of understand, um, yeah, how, how other businesses run, you know, and you can bring some of those relevant structures back into a smaller business. Obviously, not all, but um, as a business like ours grows, you you have a responsibility to, to improve your procedures and policies and all that sort of stuff. And... Um, so yeah, it was. Uh, I was very grateful for my time, um, time in that part of the industry for sure. Yeah, I, I can totally see how beneficial it would be, and and yeah, having an understanding of how businesses work laterally and, like you said, vertically, knowing what supply and demand actually means, it, it can only be beneficial to your business that you that you've had that experience that you know, like you said, know the realities of of what that means. Um, what do you think in terms of Coriol, what does Coriol offer, you know, in McLaren Vale? Without talking about new varieties, what would you kind of say makes Coriol stand out? Um, yeah, I guess there's a, a couple of things. One is the, you know, within a family business you have that commitment to, um, you know, you think about, you know, the, the, the typical reason that a lot of businesses exist in a corporate setting is to maximise shareholder return, you know, <laughs> and, um, and that has never, ever, ever been one of the objectives of, you know, <laughs> of this business. Um, and, and maybe that's not necessarily, uh, that's good and bad, you know, but we, you know, Uh, 
Um, you know, I was talking to a, a USA importer the other day, and he was telling me that you know the Napa in the US that they talk about Napa as being the second largest entertainment precinct out of Disneyland, <laughs> and um, and you think, well, that's sort of you know it. We, we do have to kind of think of ourselves as entertainment <laughs> providers because, you know, you're – and it's not how – it's not that um, – uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not that obvious, but, you know, people are coming here. I mean, I'm looking out at the car park now. It's pissing down with rain. It's an awful day. The car park's full of people in our tiny little cell door. And, sure, they're buying wine and they're having that transaction, but they're also – hopefully having a great experience with meaningful staff that, you know, um, sharing stories and, and engaging with them. And, and so, yeah, that's really, really important for us that we provide more than just, you know, some liquid in a bottle. Um, so I'm not sure that's answered your question, but, um, the, um, yeah, Coriol sort of, uh, has that advantage of being family owned and, and, and having sort of other objectives rather than, Maximi- maximizing shareholder return at all costs, <laughs> if you like, because, um, you know, that's how some businesses are run. Yeah. And the reason I asked, and you did answer that very well, the reason I asked is because, you know, Coriol's closing in on close to 55 years in business. Um, there's a reason why you've been so successful. And I think, you know, really making full use of, you um, the beautiful gardens that you have, the historic um, buildings that you have, you know, tracing that, that you know, multi-generation family history back, um, but also being able to be very adaptive to changing times, I think is part of the success of Coriol. Tell me a little bit about the alternative varieties um, that you have planted and now successfully make. Yeah, yeah. Um- I mean, that started in the troubled 80s <laughs> um, and, you know, like we talk about fashion, um, Grenache, we had Grenache here that was probably 100 years old at that point and for years like 84, 85, 86, um, you know, you, you couldn't give the fruit away. Like it was so desperately, you know, unpopular <laughs> as a variety and uh, you know the great story is that if you know, the local school if your parents grew Grenache you were teased you know <laughs> like it was just it was such a, a, a weed it was just like the, the pits as a variety <laughs> whereas now the highest price per tonne paid for any fruit in McLaren Vale is Grenache by a high margin so anyway the point with that was that um, that you know there was some head scratching like well we can't just have this vineyard sitting here just you know well I'm, I'm, I was a kid but you know my dad um and so he needed to look for something different you know something that was not available something that had an opportunity that we could create for ourselves and for you know the australian wine consuming public but um and there was anti-French sentiment because they were blowing up the Pacific and um, nuclear bombs and it was this um, this sort of, uh, um, what's the word, that kind of idea that, no, let's, you know, well, for, for my old man, that kind of like really heralding the underdog. And, and so he looked to Italy where there was no, it was huge, like, um, amounts of cultural influence in the country from Italian, obviously, um, migration, but there, there was no Italian varieties. If, if Italian people were growing grapes, they were growing Shiraz or, or whatever. And, um, and so, therefore, there was this opportunity. And look, you looked, it's not like you looked to Chianti as this sort of um, holy grail that was beautifully well organized and beautifully structured. And, you know, it was a, it was a mess. Like nobody really knew what was happening there. And, um, but there was, um, there was potential, I guess. And Sangiovese's variety is so different, you know. <laughs> and, um, and so the decision was made to, to plant it, um, not with any really strong quality reference point. It was cheap and cheerful if it was available, Chianti and wicker ba- you know, the wicker basket type thing or whatever it was. Um, but, um, yeah, there was that, that, that opportunity. And, um, and so it started there. And look, for a long time, well, maybe a long time, but five, eight years, it was pretty tough going, I think, because, you know, there you had this variety that was medium bodied, very dry, very high in acidity. Um, and so, you know, Mark will tell stories of being out in the trade, whether it was somewhere in Melbourne or down in Sydney or, and people go, oh, yeah, Mark, yeah, love you, love your Shiraz, I'll take a few cases of that and sort of ignore this, this Sangiovese because there was, they just couldn't get it, you know. And, um, but that was the, that was the opportunity. And um, so it started with that. Um, now, 30, 
how many years later it's our number one you know most important variety and um and really can't produce enough of it um and and so that sort of led then to okay well maybe there is something in this notwithstanding the the huge amounts of you know cost and opportunity cost and um and and really understanding how to manage something viticulturally because that original clone if you let it will crop at 15 tonne to the hectare um and um and so, you know, that that's obviously not what you want, but it takes, you know, it takes years to, to really understand how to manage it. Um, and um, and so, but that's exciting and it's it's sort of stimulating and it kind of, um, you know, it, it's rewarding. And so, yeah, then other things sort of followed um, followed from there. Obviously, um, things like Fiano were really important. Um, that was discovering something that, you know, Fiano is on every wine list in the country now, but 20 years ago, there was none. You know, there were two producers mainly in the world that were doing it from Campania, and they had really sort of rescued the variety, And but that was that was probably only in the mid nineties. And, um, so even though it's got a 2000 year old history, it was, you know, it was heading for, for, for oblivion. And, um, and so that was, um, a really good move because it's an awesome variety and, um, and, uh, but learned really that, you know, you need more than one person involved. And so even though we might've planted it first and had a wine out and that sort of stuff, it was like, no, we will share this around, you know, and now the biggest, wine class at McLaren Bell Wine Show is Fiano um, and uh, because everyone loves it it's great to grow it's um, I mean the last two years I've been good um, crop level wise it's been a bit of a disaster but outside of that um, you had this really interesting variety that was so well suited I mean if you go into our cellars um, you know there's from the 70s and 80s there's Rhine Rieslings there's Chardonnays there's Simeons there's Sauvignon Blancs there's so everything else has been tried but um yeah, unless it's very, very cold, none of those varieties really work in, in, in McLaren Vale. So, um, and then obviously Pickpool followed from that. Um, that was looking again for that underdog status, something that was just becoming, you know, discovered and such a textural counterpoint to Fiano. And um, and because it's not just about the, you know, um, the the opportunity, it's about how's it going to fit within your range, how, you, how are you going to differentiate it from your other products, et cetera, et cetera. And so now, um, and then there's lots of other varieties now, Nero Davila, Montepulciano, Negro Amaro, and, um, and increasingly uh, things like Grenache Blanc, Grenache Gris, Claret, et cetera. So, you know, there's this, this sort of this big open embrace of, of um, a lot of what we term the new Australian <laughs> collection. Um, and that's been a really important development. But I'd probably say over the next few years, we might actually see some consolidation um, as we really hone in on on what's really going to return, going to return us the you know the highest quality consistently year in year out. Because there's obviously things that you plant that, whether it's variety or clone, that, that don't work, and and that's part of it. And um, so yeah, it's uh, I'm very very grateful, <laughs> especially with the loss of the Chinese market that um, you know we weren't reliant on Shiraz as our only varietal. I mean, don't get me wrong, Shiraz is still extremely important to us, but um, it's not like it's 80 or 90% of our production. It's, you know, maybe 30%. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's uh, – not sure, again, if I've answered the question. but <laughs> <laughs> you, you definitely have. Um, I think it's interesting because, you know, like you said, you might consolidate and you might kind of go, this is where we're headed now. But without that experimentation, without somebody kind of, you know – ripping the Band-Aid off and planting those varieties and giving it a go, you're never going to know. So it's so important that, you know, people that are, you know, with these kind of not necessarily risk-taking but people that are, are willing to kind of plant something, see it through for a few years, see if it works, like you said, look at what the market is dictating. I mean, Pickpool is such an interesting one because – the amount of times um, pick pools come up in conversation and the and the people that say, oh, I love pick pool, I automatically say, well, you travel to Europe or you go to London because I don't know who's drinking pick pool. It's either people that, you know, manage to go and hang out in the south of France or people that are kind of, they drink a lot of pick pool in London. But it, it really is kind of um, 
interesting to hear people that know the variety. And I think it's interesting that you've planted it and that it's doing really well. I mean, it makes sense in our kind of climate. Um, but more and more, am I he- hearing people going, oh, I love pig pool. I want to drink more pig pool. And I'm like, wow, you know, like I didn't think I'd ever hear that. Yeah. And, and you know, I, we still have to temper our enthusiasm a little bit because it's a bit of a pain in the ass to grow. <laughs> you know, you, you can, um, it's not without its challenges. So, um, and obviously they sort of, thankfully in this sense, sort of mine themselves out over, over a decade or so. <laughs> but, you know, you, the, you make a decision, you have to be very aware that with something brand new that it's going to throw up some some curly ones and um, viticulturally and um, as well as from a marketing point of view and a stylistic point of view and so forth. But at, this, at the end of the day, it has to perform and um, without massive intervention. <laughs> and, um, and so, um, yeah, I think um, the – you know, there's that uh, that you know, it's got to it's got to work from a viticultural point of view. It's got to work from a style point of view. The other really interesting thing is, and it, people can often overlook this, is that it's got to also it also has to have some appeal in the pronunciation. And if you like Fiano, it's a beautiful thing to say. It's a gorgeous word. If you look at the other, you know, if you look at the other two main whites from Campania, you've got Falangina and Greco de Tufo. They don't. Like that, they're not as evocative. They're sort of they're a bit hard and a bit confusing and a bit. And so, you know, I look at say the you know you look at the great variety of Suave Garganiga or however you pronounce it, and um, you know it produces lovely wines. But I would never plant it because what hope have you got of ever really marketing? Uh, you know, I mean, come on, it's um, no. it's um, look. Maybe you can produce fifty cases to sell in your cellar door, but you know, I think people can overlook that. You know, it's it's vitally important if you're making these decisions, these expensive long term decisions, that 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 it's got a marketing opportunity and therefore a commercial <laughs> opportunity. Uh, it can be great to grow. It can produce a lovely wine, but. Yeah, it, it can also fall over at the last hurdle, um, you know, which is really, really important. Yeah, and especially like you said, you're reading the market, you're selling it to. So it's, you know, maybe, maybe you know, Falangia and Garganega rolls off the tongue in an Italian accent, but, you know, we're talking about Australians here who, you know, tend to give <laughs> slang and shortcuts to absolutely everything. So, um, yeah, it's good to, to know who you're, who is going to be buying that wine to begin with. Maybe, maybe later down the track, uh, it, you know, you'll be selling it internationally. But <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, one of our bigger markets is Japan, you know. They, <laughs> but some of those mature wine markets, like, you know, what we sell to markets like Japan or the UK or some of those more mature markets, not that export is big for us, um, it's not Shiraz, it's 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 Pickpool or Fiano or Niradavla or Montepulciano. Or, um, and so even that's quite surprising that you um, – uh, what's the word that you can create those opportunities internationally as well? I, I was probably, um, uh, what's the, uh, not, I guess just a bit surprised by that. It's, um, you know, you don't want to underestimate <laughs> the opportunity as well. <laughs> yeah. I totally agree with you. Now I would love to know Peter, if a little bit more about your palate, if you could only drink three drinks for the rest of your life, what would they be and why? Well, I have one coffee a day um, at 10 o'clock every day, long black. And, um, oh, yeah, I, don't, I can't imagine my life without it. It's, um, it's <laughs> very, very important. And I only ever want one. I never want two a day. Um, but um, so, yeah, I think coffee would certainly um, have to rank pretty highly. Um, and then probably a boring beer, you know, like a really – boring lager type of beer um not this time of the year but in summer just to finish work and and have a cold refreshing almost not tasteless but you know peroni or one of those sorts of styles of beer um is is very important and then i mean wine's got to be in there but um what what would i choose if i could only choose one i mean you'd probably have to you know, if it's Desert Island stuff, it's got to be versatile, doesn't it? So, um, you know, I, I think Sangiovese would have to be pretty, 
pretty firmly in there, even though some people think of it as relatively obtuse. I, I do find it extremely versatile with such a range of foods, which is perhaps not initially what you'd imagine with its sort of highish acidity and highish tannin. But um, it's really one of the most satisfactory wines to, to have on the table with, with dinner. Um, so, yeah, that's probably um, that's probably where I'd be, I think. I think if you – yeah, for a red wine, it's very hard to go past Sangiovese being, like you said, it's versatile. It's got amazing structure. It's, you know, aromatic qualities are so intriguing. Um, I think it's a really good choice. Who else said that? I think Chris Carpenter said that as well. And I thought, yep, yeah, you're right. That's, you know, that's got to be right up there for me as well. So excellent choices. Yeah, it's certainly not something that you'd sit down, you know, on a Tuesday night, come in from a hard day of work and pour yourself a glass of Sangiovese, like that would be irrelevant. It wouldn't be a great experience. But at the dinner table, it, it really, you know, it becomes the the full, yeah, the full compliment. So, um, yeah. I love, I love that. It tells me a little bit more about you and how you live your life and what gets you through the day. Um, it's been a real pleasure getting to hear a little bit more from you. Um, I'm really glad that you got to go and bake bread and live in um, a basement and then see the light of wine. I'm very glad that you've come back from that. And, uh, you know, I hopefully get to, to chat to you another time, maybe on site next time. Yeah, no, I would love to, love to have you down. So thanks very much for um, indulging me with um, my ramblings. I love it, Peter. Thank you very much and cheers to you. <laughs> thanks very much. This is Over a Glass. I'm Shante Whale. Stay tuned for more stories from the world of wine and drinks. Listen in every Thursday on your podcast app. Follow us on Instagram at Over a Glass Pod and contact us at overaglass at deepintheweeds.com.au.